I am live. I'm reading the lad and the lady. Oops. Um. <sighs> Sorry. I'm at part three, the lad and the lady, a novel by Joan Marshall Grant. She was a writer of her own far memories, but this one is a novel, a romantic novel about a lad, Rowan, who owns a castle in the highlands of Scotland, and Marilda, who is an American heiress. Um, they married in France, and they are now in the Highlands, and uh, they are preparing for a New Year's Eve event in Castle Cloud. He has just presented himself to her, and her last words I read were, Darling, how magnificent you look. He kissed her hand with ceremony. The men of Cloud are hard to put it to be worthy of their women, and none of them ever had such a cause to be proud. Wait until you see my dress. A slight delay was caused by his insisting on kissing several of her vertebrae before completing his duties of lady's maid, and the clock chimed the half hour before they were ready to join their guests. Goodness, we are late, she said. Dinner is due in a quarter of an hour, so as to give them time to clear before the people arrive. Leave the staff work to me and Sandy. You and I are going to make a suitably dramatic entrance, so he's going to slip up to tell us when everyone's assembled in the hall. I told him to serve the champagne cocktails there, but I thought a private glass of the Krug 28 would serve us as a heart starter, so I told him to put a battle bottle in my dressing room. Oh, my dear darling Rowan, he knows I'm nervous, but I mustn't let him guess it's more than ordinary party panic. They drank to each other standing in the firelight, which flickered on the embroidered curtains of the great bed in which eleven generations of Cadries had been conceived and born. That few of the men had died in it was also according to the family tradition. A secret, a, dis, a discreet knock on the door announced Sandy, who in a conspiratorial whisper announced that the people had all been shepherded to their correct positions. With her hand on her husband's velvet sleeve, Marilda walked slowly down the oak stairs. Below her, the great hall seemed a blur of upturned faces. I know how an actress would feel on her first night if she suddenly realized that she hadn't read her lines for the third act. None of the other actors know they are on a stage, but I must go on acting. No one must guess that I'm afraid of what may happen before the curtain falls. Rowan felt her hand tighten on his arm and felt a wave of such intense protectiveness that he almost resented the absence of an enemy whom he could challenge in her defence. The women, according to their capacity, honoured or envied Marilda for a superb entrance. The men affirmed a secret face in their several fashion. Sandy experienced uh, the same devotion which had caused him to follow Rowan through enemy crossfire. Georgina felt a twinge of panic not, not that not Marilda, but Emily was coming down the stairs on the arm of her grandson. Janet and momentary freedom from jealousy, was glad that Rowan could be so proud of his wife. Only Duncan, with the agonizing perception of the unheeded lover, knew how difficult it was for Marilda to play the role of the unruffled hostess. Rowan saw Duncan look at her and felt an exaltation of which he was immediately ashamed. Poor old Duncan, he's in love with her, and who wouldn't be? But tonight I can feel the blood of my forebears running fast in my body, and I almost wish he was a ri real rival, so that I could laugh and boast and glory, because the man I love as a brother lusts after my wife and cannot have her, for I am stronger than he. The decorations of the banqueting hall were faithful to the influence of Emily. The dinner table covered with a white damask cloth that had been specially woven in Belfast when the new wing was built, was set on the dais under the stained glass window in which the eagles of cloud found uneasy eeries among foliation unknown to the College of Heralds. Each of the four Epernes supported twelve candles in addition to the six silver dishes loaded with pear and pineapple, walnut and grape. Harsh tendrils of smilax joined silver bonbon dishes 
to the gilt menu holders, writhing between silver vases which bore yellow carnations and maidenhair fern, and by the side plate of each woman was a corsage of orchids. Maisie, in the place of honour as Marilda's only kin, was at Rowan's right, which he found somewhat distasteful as she had told him why they walked down the canvas tunnel lined with potted palms which led from the postern door outside the drawing room that he looked absolutely darling in fancy dress. She read aloud from the menu in front of her, My, my, and I thought you Scots hadn't gotten beyond old men and raw birds. Coquille Saint-Jacques, grouse, haggis, is haggis a thing you shoot to? Souffle surprise. Or surprise. <laughs> it should it surely is a surprise to find how well you do yourselves in your mountain fastness. Angels on horseback. Well, this angel's not going to do any horseback riding. I've already ripped my best nylons parading the home park. No doubt Marilda can provide you with a pair of stockings, said Rowan, with what he considered commendable restraint. But Maisie remained oblivious that she had done more than help over this sticky patch, which is always liable to occur at the beginning of a party. She patted his bare knee affectionately. I'd rather have a pair of yours. I adore all those gay colours. I'm most flattered by your approval, said Rowan. It's not a gag. I really mean it. Marilda was my bridesmaid the first time I married, but that marriage didn't take. So next time I'm going to pick a Scotsman so that I can wear a plate skirt and a dagger in my sock and a furry thing over my muff. Rowan raised his glass to her. My dear lady, is it wise to make such a statement when there are... He paused to catch the eye of those on whom he, the full beauty of the remark was not lost. When there are several Scots who may find it difficult to contain their natural ardour. The doors of cloud are thick. But who can dare to back their strength against the onslaught, onslaught of a Highlander? She giggled. You mean I ought to lock my bedroom door? Lock my bedroom door? He sighed elaborately. Our house is of a certain age. My ancestors grew weary of knuckles bruised against unyielding oak. There are secret passages. And if you should scream and a panel slides open in the wainscoting, no one will hear you, for our walls are built so thick that the cries of reluctant maidens do not disturb the sleep of dullards. Again he paused to allow the remark to sink in. Hello! <laughs> I apologize that the sliding panels are in the wainscoting. It is lesse majesty for the members of my house to bow their heads. A pitiful demonstration of economies of which you have no doubt read, which forces us to enter the rooms of desire on all fours. However, you must be tolerant of our limitations. Alistair on Marilda's right spluttered. She looked at him with becoming gravity. A crumb, Lord Darwin? Permit me to pat you on the back. It is said to be most effective when a foreign body is lodged in the windpipe. Behind the shelter of his map napkin, he whispered, my dear child, you've wrought a miracle here. Georgina, God bless her, is no longer afraid of being a woman until you've taught Rowan that it can laugh at that he can laugh at himself. He needn't fear anyone laughing at him. The emotion which surged up through the surface compliment moved him to the edge of tears. Good God, surely it wasn't becoming he wasn't becoming senar, but he loved this girl of Rowan's no more than loved. He honoured her, a very different proposition to her aunt, and better looking. Not that Emily hadn't been a good enough looker to give any man ideas which were not at all suitable about another man's wife, especially if that man were Hector. Not a bad thing to have a toast between courses, keep up the party spirit, damn good party, but have to keep it going. Why wait for Ruby before giving them a chance to let off a bit of steam? He rose to his feet, lifted his glass. To Emily, God bless her. Only Duncan knew how difficult it was for Marilda to smile as though the shouts of to Marilda were an echo to words spoken in the present hour. Pipes, at first no more than a vibration on the front shelf sound, became increasingly insistent as Robbie paced slowly backwards and forwards outside, waiting for the signal 
at which Sa Sandy and his carefully drilled second in command would fling open the doors for his entrance. Alice then noticed that his hostess gripped the arms of her chair until the knuckles were white under the skin. So the pipes moved her, he thought fondly. She has to hang on to herself, same as I do, in case anyone sees how close she is to tears. Marilda, Marilda's orders to herself were so sharp that for a moment she thought she must have spoken aloud. It's happening, but you mustn't let anyone know. Yes, Emily used the same vases, but her carnations were pink instead of yellow. How cruel of her to give Georgina that hideous blue satin. There were none of Emily's friends here, for all the men are in kilts. Alistair was a very handsome young man in spite of his side whiskers. The man who was sitting in Duncan's chair is called Roderick. Hector is jealous of him. She tried to make herself come back against the drive of the pipes, but although she could feel the carved oak hard under her hands, she still could see Roderick. He is taking a sip of wine. I wonder if it is the same as we are drinking. No, our wine won't be pressed for another twenty years. Roderick still looks quite real. Part of me is thinking that it would be pleasant to let him kiss me. But Marilda knows that next year there's going to be the Boer, Boer War war and he's going to die of enteric. If Emily knew that too, could she warn him not to volunteer? None of them would listen to a woman against the sound of the pipes. The double doors were flung open and a surge of the pipoff filled the room. Why did I think that Robbie was old? Robbie is the only person who doesn't resent my being here. The only person who isn't afraid of the Emily that everyone else pretends to ignore. She watched him slowly pace three times round the table, then stand behind the chair of his liege. Sandy stepped forward with a glass of neat whiskey, which is the dew of the piper. Robbie gave the toast of fealty and handed Sandy the now empty glass. Rowan the Gaelic, smooth and authoritative in his mouth, affirmed their loyalty to a shared heritage. Applause, applause broke the tension. If Marilda had found almost unendurable, the present rushed back as water smooths footprints from sand. She saw Robbie in the pipes tucked under his arm, stride out through the door, held open by his servitors. They clapping, even the like in some inexplicable way they had committed the breach of taste. They clapped, said Alice, and what he believed to be an inaudible whisper. They clapped as though Robbie was a bloody cavalry. Conversation sprang up like weeds, which strive to conceal the indecency of rubble. So that was chapter five. Chapter six is the rocking horse rocks. Have a lovely Friday. Friday the fourteenth.